Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. And I read, and quote, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed, and he shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. Unquote. I'm reading from the New King James. Most do not realize that this verse is perhaps one of the most prophetic verses in the Bible and that it defines and it explains the total story all through Old Testament right up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So let's explore this verse today. Before that, let's look at some explanation of the meaning of the words. Now the word enmity we can replace that word by simply saying warfare. God has warned the serpent, and this verse was spoken by God to the serpent, who was Satan, after he had tempted Eve and created sin in this world. And after that, the Lord said to the serpent those words. And the those words essentially is a warning by God essentially telling serpent, the serpent and therefore telling Satan what God is going to do to bring back control and dominion of earth. So, God essentially was telling Satan his plans that he's going to redeem and bring back the control of death from Satan. Because as we know, the penalties of sin is death. And when sin came into the world, death also came into all humanity. And death being controlled by Satan now. And God in Genesis 3.15 simply says to Satan, a warning to Satan, I will be bringing back the keys to Hades and to hell. The keys to death. In short, this is, you can see this as part one of God's plan. God is saying, I am going to get rid of the penalty of sins. In other words, I'm going to get rid of death. How does he do it? Well, 3.15 tells us. God says, I'm going to wage war with you. It says, enmity between the woman and you, you being Satan. And enmity between your seed, which is Satan's seed, and we will go there, uh, explain a bit later later on, and the woman's seed. So be warfare between the two seeds. And then more importantly, there will be a major war between he being the final seed, the seed, not seeds with an S, but the final seed will be the great warfare between him and this final seed of God and this final seed of God will crush the head of Satan. And Satan simply bruises this final seed's heel. That's what God is warning Satan. Essentially, in this verse, you can see one side of God. That God will not lie and God will tell things as they are. God even now has told Satan his plans that Satan's head will be crushed. Now, can you imagine how Satan would feel when he heard 315? He would be trembling in his feet. He would try and do everything to destroy God's plan. Try and do everything to make sure that this particular seed that God was telling Satan about that would crush his head, Satan would try his very best to destroy this seed from coming, wouldn't he? And if you read right through Old Testament up to Jesus' resurrection, you would see Satan's plans. And today we are going to summarize the plans so that we have a, an overall view, a hel helicopter view of what Satan has tried to do all the way up to Jesus' resurrection. And let's go there now. Satan's strategy will simply be this, particularly in the period that we're talking about, the entire Old Testament up to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
His strategies are twofold. The first fold is to kill, essentially get rid of what is potentially a threat for him or what potentially leads to the final seed. And the other one would be to corrupt, meaning to dilute the holy lineage of this seed. Those are in its most simplistic form Satan's strategy. Now in Genesis 3.15, who is this woman? Well, this woman, if you like, is really the lineage of Jesus, the holy line of Jesus. And the seeds of this woman are the individuals or, or the people that are chosen to continue this holy line. And of course, in the end, the seed, the seed is Jesus Christ. Now, from the Satan's point of view, well, we know who Satan is, or serpent is, and the seeds of Satan are not the descendants of Satan, because Satan is an angel, and angel does not procreate, but the seeds of Satan are his agencies. Now, his agencies could be individuals whom he influenced, or it could be situation that he has taken advantage of. So, the agencies of Satan are the seeds of Satan. So you would find that there'll be warfare, as 315 is saying, between Satan and the lineage, and finally Satan and the seed, Jesus Christ. So now let's look at some examples of what Satan has done to stop, or at least to interrupt, this holy line. He started almost immediately. I'd like you to go to Genesis 4, verse 8. At Genesis 4, verse 8, I quote, Now Cain talked with Abel with his brother, and it came to pass, when they were in the field, that Cain rose up against Abel his brother and killed him. Unquote. This is a famous story that Cain killed Abel. Now, yes, we all get it that uh, Cain killed Abel simply because Cain was well, not too happy that God didn't accept his offering. But if you look at the underlying reason why Cain rose up against his brother, if we look at that, we know the influence of Cain is Satan himself. Satan has used this agency called Cain to get rid of Abel because Satan thinks that Abel, well, knows that Abel would be and could be the holy line that the seed may come from. So he had to get do something about it, and he did something about it through Cain to kill Abel. Now, was Cain wicked, and was Cain representing Satan? Well, let's go to 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. 1 John chapter 3, verse 12. Verse 12. Here in 1 John, it's talking about or, uh, the imperative of love. And it brought in Cain as an example of what love ought not to be. It is essentially what is Satan. Now, in that verse, it says, I quote, Not as Cain, who was of the wicked one, and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? because his works were evil and his brothers were righteous." Unquote. You notice, Cain was of the wicked one, and his works were evil to get rid of his brothers who, being able, who was righteous. So what this verse is saying that Cain was influenced by Satan to get rid of the potential holy line of Jesus Christ. Now, there's the first act. Very, very quickly, Satan has got into doing his plans. But what was the reaction from God? Well, obviously, you can't beat God. Now, what happens? Go to Genesis chapter 4, verse 25, to see God's reaction. I quote, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son named and named him Seth. For God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel, whom Cain killed. Unquote. Now, I want you to 
Note the word, God has appointed another seed for me instead of Abel. Now, the actual meaning of the word Seth is actually translated into the English word substitute. God has substituted his righteous lineage, Abel, with Seth. Clearly stated here. So what's happening now? God has said, well, if you try something, I'm going to respond. If you got rid of Abel, Satan, I'm going to replace Abel with a substitute called Seth. And if you've read your Bible all the way through, you know the lineage, the holy lineage of Jesus Christ started from Seth. So this is one example. Now, there are many other examples in the Old Testament, and we're just going to go through very quickly the, some of those examples just to give you a feel for what Satan's strategy uh, is all about. We fast forward to Noah. Noah had three sons, Shem, Japheth, and Ham. And the Bible tells us that the lineage came from Shem, which went down southeast part. And the other two, Ham and Japheth, went to the west and went to the north. Now, the Bible clearly tells us that the lineage of Ham and Japheth were the lineage, if you like, the seeds of Satan, who became Israel's arch enemy. And the Bible also very clearly tells us the warfare and the attempts of the lineage of Ham and Japheth in trying to destroy the Israelites. And guess where that comes from? The influence comes from Satan himself to try to get rid of the holy lineage of Jesus Christ. And let's move to Abram or Abraham, where through the influences of Satan, the first son, Ishmael, was born to Abram or Abraham. Now that was not born through God's choice, but it was born through a human choice. That Satan must have whispered into Abraham's ears now for 25 years that God had not fulfilled his promise of giving you a son. And you know your wives, Sarai, is barren. She can't produce any children. So can you trust your God? Now this is what Satan would have continuously put into Abram and Sarai's mind. And guess what happens? They have made a decision to have a children with the servant of Sarai, Hagar. And the result was Ishmael. Now, Abram heeded the voice of Sarai, just as Adam did his wife Eve. And the result was an unholy lineage, namely through Ishmael. And of course, the Bible also states that Abram finally, or Sarai finally, was conceived miraculously, even at that time, she was biologically unable to conceive and neither was Abram able to, to produce children. And yet they produced Isaac. Now we know the Bible tells us Isaac was this holy lineage that's coming through. Now what was Ishmael's job? Ishmael's job was simply to get rid of Isaac. That was Satan's plan. I'd like you to go to Galatians chapter 4, verse 28 and 29, and I quote verse 28. Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are children of promise. And 29, I quote, But as he who was born according to the flesh, when persecuted him who was born according to the spirit, even so it is now, unquote, now, the one who is born of the Spirit was referring to Isaac, and the one who was born according to the flesh was referring to Ishmael. Ishmael was born, and he wanted to destroy Isaac. Now, who planned this? You guessed it. 
Now the lineage of Isaac was then Jacob and Esau. Same situation here. Esau's character was like who? Very similar to Satan's. He disobeyed his father and married Canaanites where he shouldn't be. Sold his birthrights for a simple plate of lentils. Jacob, the nice kid, was hated by Esau. Esau hated his brother. And Esau actually said, I will kill my brother. Now, who was behind all this? The influence of Satan to get rid of the holy lineage that's to come from Jacob. I'd like you to go to Genesis chapter 27, verse 1. Genesis uh, verse 41. Genesis chapter 27, verse 41. And I quote, So Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father blessed him. And Esau said in his heart, The days of mourning for my father are over. Then I will kill my brother Jacob. Unquote. Guess who is behind, uh, behind Esau's hatred? You guessed it. Satan's plan. Plan one, destroy the holy lineage. Now did Esau win? No, he didn't. God wins in the end, and we know that. Then you fast forward. One of 12 sons of Jacob was Joseph. And we know in the Bible very clearly what Joseph had suffered, the injustice Joseph has suffered from his brothers. He was sold as slave to Egypt. And, and the goodness about Joseph was, was seen clearly that he refused to commit adultery, and he ended up in a prison. Joseph was the holy lineage protected by the Lord. And yet, he had 12 others or 11 other brothers who wanted to get rid of him. In fact, they successfully sold him and thought that they had killed him. But did God protect Joseph? Yes. Why? Well, simply because we know what happens. Joseph became the prime minister of Egypt. And because of his position, he was able to plan for a seven years of famine. By the way, the seven years of famine brought about by none other than the adversary Satan who wants to get rid of the entire clan of the holy lineage that Jacob was going to be producing. Now this shows another situation that Satan can create. He creates this seven years of famine. But guess what happens that matches the seven years of famine? There were seven years of prosperity before the famine. Guess who was behind the prosperity? You guessed it, our Lord. So you see, at every turn, our Lord knew exactly what Satan was going to do, and he had a alternative redemptive plan. If Joseph hadn't been sold by his brother to Egypt, guess what would have happened to the lineage or the family or the entire family of Jacob? They would have and could have starved to death. But they didn't, did they? And now the last very quick example, because there are many other examples in the Bible in the Old Testament, and I encourage you to go through it with this um, focus in mind. Think about why God brought Abraham out of Ur, or the southeastern part of the Mesopotamia, if you like, and to bring him to Canaan. Well, simply because God knew and God has planned where the future Messiah, the seed who will crush the head of Satan, will come from. The holy lineage will end up the, at the birth of Jesus Christ in Canaan, which is where Bethlehem and Jerusalem will be. And that's why Abram was asked by God to get out of Ur, and head towards a land that God is going to give him. And that was Canaan. Now I did mention just now that there are two strategies to Satan's um, objective of getting rid of this holy lineage. One is to kill, which we have gone through some examples then. And the other one is to corrupt the seed. Well, one example of corrupting the seed is clearly seen in Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Genesis chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. And I quote, 
Now it came to pass when men who began to multiply on the face of the earth and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Unquote. Now, I want to explore this in the light of Satan's second strategy, that is to corrupt the seed. The sons of God in this instance is the righteous ones, are the seeds and the lineage of Seth, who was the righteous one. And the daughters of men in this instance meant the unrighteous one, the seeds and the, or the lineage of Cain, the unrighteous one. So guess what's happened? If you dilute and if you put a bit of black ink into a white paint, what happened to the white pure paint? It's adulterated. It becomes gray. It doesn't have the holiness that's required to produce the holy person. And this is what Satan's strategy was, just to co-mingle the righteous ones with the unrighteous ones. Guess what? The sons of God saw the beautiful daughters of men, meaning the descendants of Seth, saw the descendants of Cain, and the intermarriage, and when they intermingle and intermarriage, the holiness was diluted. And Satan wanted the seeds to lose his identity, simple as that. Can you imagine that? That, well, there were at least 1,656 years between the creation and Noah's flood, or the flood. Now, can you imagine, Adam lived 930 years, lived for 930 years. How many children can a human being multiply when you live around 1,000 years? Many, 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 many human beings. Now, how many children can a man produce, a man and a woman, in 1,600 years? I would say millions of children. So there must have been millions of people who were commingled and it became unrighteous or at least adulterated. You know, this was Satan's plan right at the beginning in Genesis to corrupt the seed, and he did it successfully. There were millions of people who were corrupt and unrighteous at Noah's days. And Noah had 120 years to convince them, to preach to the unrighteous and wicked world that was created by this co-mingling of the righteousness and unrighteousness. And Noah had eight people saved. The rest of the world was wicked, wicked, wicked. And guess who was behind this plan? You guessed it, Satan. And what this God's plan was? God had to get rid of everyone. But before that, he gave everyone an opportunity through the preaching of Noah. But only eight went into the ark. The entire world was wicked to its core. Who planned this? That was a second strategy of Satan, to dilute and to stop this lineage that God has planned. But did Satan win? No. There were eight people who were saved. So now, in conclusion, you can see from the very quick examples, and there are many more in the Bible, and I encourage you to read it right through, that in the end, God won. God produced his seed, or through the holy lineage, Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ died on the cross so that he can be resurrected to reclaim death from Satan. So Jesus, the seed, conquered death from Satan, even though he died, meaning bruised. So going back to Genesis 3.15, you can see the plan of God and you can see the plan of Satan who had failed despite his attempts. And then finally, the seed, the final seed crushed the head of Satan, meaning reclaim the control of death from Satan. But Satan only bruised the heel of the seed. Now in Genesis 3.15, the Emphasis was the head and the heel. Now, if your head was bruised compared to the heel being bruised, I know which one I don't want to be bruised. 
Once a head is bruised, the damage is much greater than a little nip on the heel. That's essentially what 315 was saying to us. So in conclusion, in conclusion, you can see the plan of God, more importantly, making sure that the holy lineage will come through to finally arrest death back from Satan. And at Calvary, when Jesus died bodily as a human being and resurrected, resurrected into a divine self, he had conquered death. He had brought and redeemed death from Satan and that the penalty of sin at Calvary for humanity was finally paid for. God bless us all.